They were considered to be dishonourable among men, and in most countries they were reviled and made to live on the fringes of society, well away from the main citizens. It's no surprise that the vocation of medieval executioners is up there as one of the most undesirable jobs in the Middle Ages, along with leech collector and gong farmer. Lawlessness and crime were widespread across the world. Rape, murder, theft, heresy, every type of sin and debauchery ran unchecked throughout medieval society. Most countries were trying to move away from the idea of criminal prosecutions being a private matter. The authorities developed new legal procedures whereby they could arrest suspects without waiting for an accusation from the victim. This meant that they could investigate, question and secure a confession from the accused and, once found guilty, for most people justice was swift, brutal and without mercy. With most criminals evading arrest, an example had to be made of those who were caught, and what better deterrent than a public execution? One of the earliest recorded positions of official executioner dates from the beginning of the 13th century. Nicknamed La Justice, Nicholas Johann was appointed in Normandy, northern France. The idea of having just one person responsible for any state-sanctioned killing quickly spread throughout the rest of Europe as capital punishment became more and more popular in a bid to rid the towns of lawlessness. But just what was it like to be a medieval executioner? Well, let's travel back in time and have a look at the life of a medieval executioner. Welcome to Medieval Madness. It's a dirty job, but somebody has to do it. It was William the Conqueror who reintroduced beheading to Britain as an official form of execution. Convicted of treason for his part in the Revolt of the Earls, Wallef, Earl of Northumbria, was beheaded with a sword in May of 1076 on St Giles Hill near Winchester. But the majority of beheadings took place in the capital, at the Tower of London, and at Tower Hill, just outside the walls, because it was the main prison for highborn traitors. In fact, a permanent scaffold stood on Tower Hill from 1485 for those who might not necessarily have betrayed their country, but had just really annoyed the reigning monarch in some way. For commoners found guilty of high treason, the punishment was far less dignified and much more brutal. Lowborn men were hanged, drawn and quartered, and lowborn women were burnt at the stake. Simply put, there were two types of beheadings, by axe or by sword. Either way, the prisoner would be blindfolded so that they did not see the weapon bearing down on them and at the crucial moment flinch or move. Execution by axe meant that a wooden block, often shaped to accept the neck, would be used. The prisoner would kneel and lean forward so that their neck rested on the block, with the head being in a downward position. With the neck prominent, there was a better angle for the stroke of the axe. In Britain, the traditional woodsman's axe was used, usually with a blade about 20 inches long, 10 inches wide, and with a 5 foot long handle. By sword, the person was made to kneel down, or if they were particularly short, it could be done whilst they were standing up. Most European swords were over 3 feet long, and weighed over 4 pounds. Both the axe and the sword had handles long enough for the executioner to use both hands, giving him the greatest control. The desired outcome was that the head was severed with a single blow, and if carried out correctly, it was a humane method of capital punishment. Unfortunately, this was not always the case, because the vertebra and muscles in the neck are strong, and it might take several blows to completely separate the head from the body. Mary, Queen of Scots, who was executed for treason during the reign of Elizabeth I, found herself on the other end of a botched beheading in 1587. The first strike missed and hit her on the back of the head. The second severed her neck, but it took a third blow to completely decapitate her. Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury, was executed under the orders of Henry VIII in 1541 for plotting against the king and supporting Catholicism. She had to be dragged to the block and have her neck held there by force. The more experienced executioner had been sent to the north to deal with rebels, and poor Margaret was left to the mercy of an inexperienced boy to carry out the sentence probably felt similar to when they give you an apprentice hairdresser. The French ambassador who witnessed the spectacle reported that the youth, quote, hacked her head and shoulders to pieces in the most pitiful manner. Apparently, it took 11 strikes before she was pronounced dead. 
In any event, a beheading is always a gruesome affair, as there are both the carotid and jugular veins in the neck that spurt blood when severed and cause massive hemorrhaging. There have also been descriptions of the eyes and mouths of severed heads moving after a beheading, because the brain still has about 7 seconds of stored oxygen after it has been amputated. Living on the Edge the black-robed, hooded image that we often have of the medieval axe-wielding executioner is a common stereotype. But an executioner rarely wore a black robe, those participating in a beheading would often be stripped to the waist, as the blood splatter could be washed off easier that way. And wearing a hood to preserve anonymity was pointless, everyone in the area knew who the executioner was. It was a job that no one wanted. When all was said and done, whether it was by beheading, hanging or burning, the executioner was believed to be a disturbed individual, ready and willing to take a life on command, a sinner with no chance of salvation. Many found the position thrust upon them, passed on from father to son, because the whole family was reviled, and any children of an executioner were unable to get honest work, as the guilds refused them entry. Others were convicted criminals themselves, who were willing to take on the job of killing others to have their own capital sentence overturned. In almost every culture, the medieval executioner was ostracised and detested by society. In most countries, they had to live with their families away from everyone else. In France, they had to wear a red or yellow coat that singled them out as dishonourable. They were given their own table at inns and public houses where no one else sat, and had their own tankard, as no one wanted to be polluted by anything that they had touched. In Germany, they were particularly hated, and in Strasbourg, they were denied Holy Communion and made to stand at the back of the church during services. Even their graves were separated from the rest of the citizens. In England, you could actually be awarded compensation if you were mistaken for an executioner, and in Spain, his house was painted red, and his fee was thrown at him rather than handed to him. Everyone feared contamination from direct physical contact with such a dishonourable man. For Spaniards, the garrote was the chosen method of execution. It involved the prisoner being restrained in a high-backed chair, a metal band placed around the neck. The executioner would stand behind and tighten the band with a crank, until asphyxiation occurred. He was always arrested for murder after he had carried out the killing, but he was also always tried and then acquitted because he had, quote, committed murder by virtue of his office. Most of the work was infrequent, and executioners travelled around a region from town to town to carry out their duties, so their wages were rarely enough to live on. Therefore, it was necessary for them to make money in other ways, such as tax collecting from prostitutes and lepers, cleaning latrines or working as knackers, which involved removing the carcasses of dead or dying animals from public roads. In Dijon, France, they were tasked with killing any pigs that were found within the town limits, as this was illegal. In fact, they were given any other jobs that might be essential, but were also denigrated within society because they were filthy or seen as degrading. There were some perks though. In Paris, the executioner was allowed to take a portion of every load of grain that came into the marketplace. But he had to use some form of utensil to scoop the grain and wasn't allowed to touch it with his bare hands for fear that he would contaminate it. They were also entitled to all of the property left by the condemned person. A headsman was expected to carry out their job in a professional manner for fear of being accused as cruel or incompetent. Failure to achieve a successful beheading, such as taking more than three swings of an axe or sword, could have dire consequences. Unsatisfied spectators have been known to attack an inefficient executioner. If he survived the assault, he would be financially punished by the loss of his fee, and might even face imprisonment or be removed from his position. Hanging For violent crimes that were committed openly, such as murder, the typical punishment was beheading. But for crimes that were deemed more treacherous, sneaky and cunning, such as theft and treason, punishment would often be hanging. The authorities could then decide what form of hanging was the best for the committed crime. Should a rope be used, or a chain? Should the prisoner be hanged, drawn and quartered? How long should the body be exposed on the gallows and left to rot as an example for all to see? Almost every medieval town or village had a permanent gibbet where public executions could be carried out, usually on higher ground whereby everybody could get a good view. It was rare to find a gibbet that did not have a skeleton or corpse dangling from it, left to decompose as a warning for others. 
The executioner would climb up a ladder and tie the rope to the crossbeam. The noose would be placed around the prisoner's neck, and he or she would be suspended and strangled to death. The prisoner or their family might actually be expected to pay for the rope themselves, or the executioner might even buy it so that he could sell it later as a souvenir, or display it in the local pub for a small fee. It wasn't until the 19th century that the long drop method was used at hangings. This was a more humane technique, as it instantly broke the neck, making death instantaneous rather than the slow process of strangulation. In some cases, the judge would order that the condemned should be disciplined by experiencing the horrific sensation of hanging only. So the prisoner would have rope tied beneath the armpits instead of the neck before they were suspended. This also had its dangers though, as the weight of the body might tighten the ropes around the chest and cause asphyxiation anyway. Many were found to be dead when they were cut down after this form of punishment. A dirty business. In order to protect himself from being accused of murder, the executioner would always present his warrant, a license that permitted him to execute the sentence of death. Today, we can find it undesirable that the occupation of an executioner was so despised. Taking another life, no matter how vile or sinful that person may be, will always seem abhorrent. Being an outcast from society pushed him into earning money from all the degrading jobs that no one else was willing to do. The job of medieval executioner was a solitary and gruesome life, but it was better than being on the other side of the axe. I do hope you've enjoyed this video, and please be sure to subscribe as we do release videos every week. Cheers!